I'm going to show you there is something else that you do is you draw these partitioning and then you erase it little by little because uh, we, we as, as time goes, uh, depending on the values of phi at a given state. And the idea is that after uh, <coughs> the uh, nth eigenfunction uh, should only be dominated by this function t of the order of something, which depends on uh, uh, lambda. So as lambda increases, you just keep what you consider is the important part of the boundary. And then you play the game of seeing whether the functions are localized there, okay? So it's part, I think, of a long story of something called Anderson localization, which I don't understand. Uh, it's, uh, okay, uh, for the moment it looks like, yes, this thing happens, and we, we I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure we understand why, okay? Anyway, picture. And uh, yeah, then I'll comment a little bit. So first, I'll show you, uh, it's going to be uh, fast, but it's not so important. Uh, okay, where is it? Uh, I'm making things first. Uh, okay. Let me, oh, oh I, I see. Uh, strangely enough, there are two fails. So if you look here, this was a thing drawn by hand, and it disappears little by little. So this is a picture that uh, Marcel did. And I show you the other one. The other one is a little longer. It's the same thing plus, uh, plus the localization of the eigenfunction. Okay, here we go. First eigenfunction. Second eigenfunction, I hope. Otherwise, I'm in trouble. Okay, so it looks like I might be... It's coming or not? No, no, it's not coming. Uh, well, why does it the second eigenfunction show up? Okay, so it's going to be a little less, or is it very slow? I have paused it. How do I unpause it? I can try this. Uh, that's what I thought, but at the same time, this thing here says that I'm allowed to pause, right? Anyway, so I'll describe what, what happens, and this way I win a little bit of time. So the thing goes from 1 to 100. Of course, I mean, we tested it. Let me try to see whether, uh, yeah, I guess the other one is, uh, yeah, okay. So anyway, uh, what would happen is that uh, the, the network disappears little by little, and the, uh, the eigenfunctions, uh, are very nice and they always stay in the part of a, uh, of a domain. Uh, they, they don't cross boundaries, they stay localized in one in here. And I should uh, warn you that this, this picture precisely can be disputed. So we had uh, interesting conversations with uh, Dvorsky. Uh, it's, not, it's, it's not really a proof in itself, but ap apparently uh, when you take uh, other examples that are less, uh, it's because you, you could say maybe it's because there are potential whales and the eigenfunctions live inside potential whales. Apparently the latest development that I asked uh, Svitlana uh, recently, just, just to be sure to not tell you too many lies, is uh, apparently there is a little bit more to these pictures than just localization inside potential whales. But it's hard for me to explain that to you because uh, at the same time, uh, you know, I'm not showing you the potential, for instance. Right. And again, so in, in principle, what happens is that we have this phenomenon, we'd like to understand it. Uh, then Marcel and Svitlana were interested in finding some automatic way of cutting the domain into pieces instead of doing it by hand, so that it would look uh, less... Uh, Uh, less, a little bit less like uh, like cheating, but okay. Uh, that that was essentially the motivation, and I, I I think it's fun, especially when you can get to watch the whole movie, <laughs> and, not just, and not just the beginning. Okay, so I should say that my computer shows it entirely, right? <laughs> but anyway, okay. So this is uh, this is what uh, Marcel did. 
so, uh, of course, I mean, if you try to do it automatically, there is a first reflex for people that like to do functionals. So just try to write down a functional and then minimize it, and uh, the domains would be minimizers of a functional. Okay? So let me see. Uh, so the main object is this functional in the middle here. There is some notation. So the first thing is uh, you cut the you want to cut the domain into pieces. The pieces will be called w. Uh, sorry, will be called vj. Okay. Uh, on vj there will be a function uj that leaves. So a function is uh, as one derivative in L2 of the whole Rn. And the way I say uh, it is localized into the domain is I say that it's equal to zero almost everywhere under the complement. Okay. Uh, this is nice for me because I don't have to tell you that the domain vj is regular uh, so that I can give you this definition. But of course, I hope the domain vj will automatically be regular at the end. Okay? And then I minimize the functional. So the, uh, here you recognize the energy of a function, which is one of the main terms. Uh, then uh, there was an initial potential. And I'm uh, saying that actually the energy corresponding to the operator is this one. Okay. Uh, I'll comment about that a little uh, later. So this is something that, that comes here. And then uh, we add a term that depends essentially on the volumes of the domains. And I'll tell you in a second why uh, you need, we need to add that. But the important part should be the main one in the middle. Okay. Uh, so again, I'm skipping some of the details because I, I want to save time for, uh, for the rest. Uh, what happens is that we l started from this uh, equation. We computed the energy, and this thing here is, after a change of variable, uh, the difference of energy between uh, uh, you, you, you keep the values of a landscape function, and then you allow to change the function itself. You compute how much difference of energy uh, you get, and you minimize something like this, okay? And I change variables here to make it simpler. So before the function was forced to be equal to the landscape function on the boundary of a domain, and now it's forced to be zero on the boundary of a domain. And this is why uh, you get this, okay? So it's some computation that we did with, uh, uh, with the operator, yeah? So this again, this is coming. This is the yeah. This is the potential. And again, I'm, I'm saying uh, this essentially is the energy uh, associated to this operator. Uh, uh, again, here we could there are two ways to write down things: either in terms of a whole collection of u j, or you just take u is equal to the sum of a u j. Okay, it's just one single function, and then you get this energy here. Right? And it, but. Okay, the, the, uh, there is this strange constraint that we force the function to be equal to zero on uh, the collection of boundaries. Yeah. Minus two u j corresponds to. Okay. Here is the functional, same functional here. Uh, so again, uh, m of u is this uh, second part here, and uh, for instance, if you look at the landscape function, it minimizes this functional here. So uh, this part here is coming from the fact that you look, you took, for instance, Laplacian is equal to minus one instead of zero. Okay. And uh, no, yeah, it comes from a landscape function, and again, it's some way. Okay, it, it is, uh, it is the way. If you try to take this function u j to be large, uh, then you will win something on the functional because you have a minus two u j. Otherwise, all the rest is positive. So the only incentive you have to get a non-negative function is because of this term up there. Okay? And th there is an arbitrary part, which is we decided 2uj, because it's a, you know, it corresponds to landscape function, which is the size equals 1. If I put 27, it would be OK. Uh, and we, we don't know that precisely, what we are doing. Okay? But, OK, so that's, again, so this was again the functional. The, so first term is energy term. Second term is m of u, uh, which corresponds to the specific problem. I should say that as, as soon as we start studying uh, the regularity of a problem and so on and so forth, m of u will be small compared to the rest. And I have to say a little bit about f. Uh, f 
is a volume term that we decided we had to add because otherwise the minimizers would be trivial. Uh, if you don't add this uh, term, if you just minimize the sum of the two, it is your interest to take one single domain and a function u which is as large as possible. Because uh, remember, you're adding constraints that the functions uj are zero on some additional piece of a boundary. And so the only way to compensate for this is to add a volume term that favors when you cut the domain into a certain number of pieces. Okay? How do you favor the fact that you cut the domain into a non-trivial number of pieces? Is you make uh, the functional pay for volume. And for instance, typically you add uh, your term volume squared so that if you cut the domain into two equal parts, the functional will be smaller. Okay? So convexity here. Uh, this is another thing that I'll talk about. I mean, you want to pay for volume for reasons that I'll explain afterwards. Okay. And uh, finally, there is this number of phases n, and you could decide two ways. Either you say it in advance, I want 20 pieces, or uh, you could say, I don't want to know it in advance. You start with uh, 10,000 pieces, and you hope but the functional will give you only 20 pieces because uh, yeah. otherwise it would be, and, and it works, uh, so it's okay. okay. Same functional again. Uh, so I'll use this excuse to talk a little bit about the alt kafarelli friedman free boundary problem. So I'm saying this functional here is looking a lot like the alt kafarelli friedman functional. Uh, the alt kafarelli friedman functional, uh, I mean the standard one at least, because now I realize that uh, there are more than one, uh, comes with only one or two phases, let's say two phases, uh, u1 and u2. And when it comes with only two phases, there is a trick, which doesn't even appear as, as a trick in, uh, in that case, which consists of taki in taking v is equal to u1 minus u2. Uh, this gives you a single real valued function. It makes your life a little bit easier, and then if you just uh, look at a functional, this this is the typical uh, alt kafarelli friedman functional. Uh, it's more like ours, except that there is no m term, it disappears. But in some variants of a functional, they, they also add other terms. And the volume term has this specific <coughs> form, which is you pay some function q plus when uh, the first function is alive you pay some function q minus when the second function is alive, and you pay zero when, uh, uh, when u is equal to zero, okay? So it's really looking like this. Uh, so for instance, in, uh, in our case, uh, we put some convexity on the volume form, so it's not exactly like this, but it sort of corresponds to taking two constants, q plus and q minus. And for us, it's, I mean, we don't want to favor one domain with respect to the other one, so typically we would take q plus is equal to q minus is equal to one, okay, plus convexity. Okay. So anyway, this looks a lot like it. Uh, again, this initially stand, I started, I think, from studying, uh, you know, two domains with a free boundary in the middle and two equations uh, satisfied by the function above and below. Uh, here, we're sort of forgetting this. We're just looking at the functional. But uh, this point of view existed, and. Uh, Okay, so there are small differences between our functional and the standard one and a big, a big one. The small ones is that we have this slightly different term uh, here. We add and we have an additional term m of u, but it's, I, I claim it's not very important. It just makes our life more complicated because we never know whether we can quote results from papers or not. But uh, essentially what happens is that we end up doing some of the proofs that look a lot like uh, other proofs. Okay. And then the main one is that we have a certain number of phases, and that's what I'll try to explain a little bit more about. Uh, I didn't check really. Can you hear me from the? <laughs> this is good. <laughs> Sorry. OK, so, uh, so now uh, I'm looking at this functional. I'm trying to say as much as I can on the minimizers of a functional. So the first question that you ask is whether minimizers exist. And essentially, uh, 
yes, it's not so hard. The main point is that we had an energy term at the beginning. Uh, we said things, for instance, you ask the, let's, let's ask even the potential to be bounded on the Levis. Then the energy term controls the M term by Poincaré, essentially. So as long as the energy term is bounded, the other one is going to be uh, stay uh, bounded here. And uh, it controls it so well that even the, the little place where you could expect to win, which is the minus U term, uh, is uh, also controlled by the energy in a, in a strong way. So uh, anyway, ev if everything stays with bounded energy, and then uh, you can prove existence. It's not so hard. Okay. Uh, now we're talking about regularity. The, so the regularity, essentially, at least for us, the main difficulty was to get started. And uh, there is one uh, argument that is always used in this uh, business, at least to start the estimate, which is you have, maybe I'll draw my standard picture. Uh, you look at your minimizer, let's say in a ball. You have you know, boundary values. And let me do as if there were three phases. Let's say U1 is alive here. U2 exists here, U3 exists here. Uh, you want to get some information, for instance, on the total amount of energy which is inside this ball. And the typical thing you do is, in principle, you take the harmonic extension of a function to the domain, compare it with your, uh, uh, with your initial one, get some information, and, uh, and proceed. And here, of course, it's not completely clear what is the harmonic extension of U1, U2, U3. And that's, that's, uh, that's our initial problem, at least. Okay? You had only two functions. I would look at u1 minus u2, harmonic extension, and it would give a good competitor. And I'm not really lying. Uh, let's say 90% of the proofs, you use this competitor. Right? And, and, and then afterwards, you, you can try to get more subtle. Okay? So we'll have to talk about that a little bit. OK. So uh, because of this, we have this extra term. Uh, we, ha we have this uh, extra work to do to show that minimizers are actually given by other continuous functions. In the standard case, uh, it's, it's too easy. You don't even mention it. Right? OK, so that's an extra step. And I'll say a few words about that later, but probably not much. Then uh, the next step is to show that they are Lipschitz. Uh, and again, I decided to skip that part. Uh, for this part, there is this beautiful monotonicity formula that some of you have heard about, where you take two quantities that are related to the energy for two different domains. You take the product of those two. Uh, in our case, it could possibly be three, of, uh, three domains, but it is typically two of a domain. Okay? So you multiply these two guys, and the product is a non-decreasing uh, function of a radius. Okay, some, uh, it's a beautiful thing. Uh, it's very useful, and of course, we use it too. Uh, we use the version which is in the paper of uh, Caffarelli, Jerison, and Kelly. But okay, so th this is less striking in the sense that we have to be a little bit more careful, but it's, uh, there is this monotonicity formula that helps a lot. The next stage is non degeneracy of uh, uh, functions uj. Uh, Non-degeneracy means, if, if I had been uh, writing the equations, uh, I would have had, let's say, two equations. Like, for instance, the two functions are harmonic or satisfy a simple equation on the two domains. Let's imagine we have only two domains. And then there is some relation between the uh, normal derivatives of the two functions on the two sides of the domain. Typically, I think square of the first one minus square of the second one is equal to uh, Q plus minus Q minus, or Q plus squared minus Q minus squared, I don't remember. Okay, some equation like this. And it's very important, if you want to continue uh, the study, to show something like this, that the functions don't decay very slowly when you approach the boundary, that instead uh, they have this sort of uh, brutal way of becoming zero. Okay? This, uh, typically, we get because uh, okay, because we pay for volume. Okay? So remember, for instance, I gave you this possible formula with A times the volume plus B times the volume squared. In 
in order to get this, we have to take A to be, let's say, strictly positive, uh, larger than some constant. Okay? And in the standard Alcafarelli business, it means that Q plus and Q minus should be bounded away from zero. Okay? That's an idea. And again, it's not so shocking. Uh, this is good because then you can play the game of blow up limits. So you have your functions, uj, uh, corresponding to one minimizer. You want to know what they look like at small scale. So you do a blow up limit. Uh, because the functions are lip sheets, you can get information on the blow up limit. So I mean, uh, the way you have to scale is, uh, uh, is well, uh, I mean, it's suited to lip sheets functions. So I mean, it's good to know that the functions are lip sheets because the blow up limit you want to take them with some scaling, which is the scaling of Lipschitz functions. So you get limits uh, when you're doing blow-ups, right? So you're looking at smaller and smaller scales, okay? Uh, and uh, this part here is important too because uh, you also get this way that the blow-up limits don't disappear, which is the second danger when you're doing blow-up limits. The first one being that the limit doesn't exist, and the second one is if the limit is zero, you're in trouble. So anyway, uh, because of this, you know that blow up limits, so if you look at a function at very, very small scale, you look at what, what it looks like, uh, it becomes a minimizer of a functional. Uh, in this functional, the term m disappears because it doesn't scale like the other ones. I mean, I mean we, we expected that it would have smaller contributions, so in the limit, it disappears. You only get two terms. And even the term with a volume is simplified because essentially you get the derivative of a volume with respect to small variations, which means essentially you pay one constant for the first uh, uh, phase, another constant for the other phase, and you know, a third constant if there are three phases, uh, and so on. Okay. Uh, and uh, if you are in dimension less than three or equal, uh, then what happens is that the blow up limits are known. It's the same blow up limits as in the Alpha Farley Friedman functional, so people work very hard, and they are very simple. Essentially, they're given that by affine functions that go all the way through the three boundary, okay? And maybe there is two affine functions with different slopes. Maybe there is only one affine function as zero here, uh, or if, you, you know, in some cases, you just get one affine function, but uh, don't worry about this. So anyway, we control them very well. And what happens is that in higher dimensions, we expect more complicated behaviors of a, uh, of a blow-up limit. So, okay. so we, we wouldn't have a theorem everywhere. Okay. So at this point, so we are saying that, for instance, all the blow-up limits, so if you look at the three boundary, uh, so the place, I mean, the boundary of this uh, place here, from one of the functions, it just turns out in your in dimension less than three or equal, uh, it turns out that the free boundary is always looking like a plane, hyperplane, okay? Okay. which may look weird to you because we started with, let's say, 27 phases. And uh, when you look at the blow up limit, there is only two half spaces available. And it essentially is, uh, I mean, it's equivalent or it's the same as saying that actually. Uh, you never have three of a phases, three of a regions that touch in a non-trivial way at a given point. This is part of a this is part of a problem, and in in, in in fact, I mean, this really comes from this, if I remember correctly. Okay. Uh, right. And then uh, you are either happy or not happy, depending on uh, the special story about the n phases is finished because locally, you know that there is only two phases that are active, maybe some other place with two different uh, phases. You can try to look at uh, the standard results on the uh, alt kafarelli friedman functional and get the same sort of regularity as there, modulo the fact that, uh, I mean, I, I, for instance, I did not check everything uh, by far because we have a slightly different volume term and we have uh, this additional term m. So in fact, my claim is that probably the same proofs work. And I didn't read uh, the same proofs. Okay. 
but uh, also specialists like uh, David Klein, something like this. Okay, so that that was the program. Okay, I'm going to mute him because uh, yeah, I was so afraid of going too slowly like last time, but uh, this time I'm going too fast. Okay, so uh, uh, so now what I do is some remarks on the statement, and then I'll try to make some remarks on the proof. The remark of the statement is that we thought, uh, in particular, uh, me, myself, because I'm, uh, <laughs> first I don't read, and uh, second, I'm always very optimistic. So anyway, we thought that we would be the only ones to try to look at functionals like this with more than n phases. Uh, we looked a little bit, we didn't find anything, and then, of course, uh, as soon as we were finished, we, uh <laughs> we realized that some other people had been working on the same problem, or you know, similar problems, not exactly the same one. Uh, in particular, there is this thing by Bukur and Velishkov, which I think is, uh, so they, they don't proceed in the same way, uh, but they get faster. Uh, one of the main reasons of what I said, which is that uh, you'd never have three phases uh, staying in the same place or touching the same point. And they prove this by, remember, there was this monotonicity formula that is supposed to be very helpful. Uh, they have a similar monotonicity formula with three phases, and they say that in this case, the product of the three, uh, of the three functions associated to the three phases or more goes to zero, which means that uh, asymptotically these things don't touch each other. Uh, and, and then I think they have uh, some way of saying that if they don't touch each other asymptotically, it means that they're really not there, uh, the three of them. Uh, then there is uh, uh, things that look uh, very interesting by Ramos, Tavares, and Terracini. Uh, it's not exactly the same problem because we look at the, they try to optimize for, let's say, the third, eigen uh, the third eigenvalue on the domain Vj. Uh, in fact, their thing looks more interesting, but uh, I didn't read it. I mean, it still looks too recent for me. And uh, recently also I found out that Caffarelli and uh, Karakanyan uh, and Lin have been studying many phases in a slightly different setting where they're actually having evolutions uh, for a problem related to studying segregation of species. I mean, the n domains would be places where different species live. There is this assumption that the species cannot, uh, cannot be in the same place, and uh, you try to know wh what they evolved to. Uh, okay, it's, uh, yeah, it's interesting too. And it, uh, apparently it's still slightly too recent. Okay, so more comments about the proof. So there is something that I don't like, but um, fortunately it's like this uh, so far. Uh, in order to get C1, the int, uh, to, uh, C1 free boundaries, okay. uh, there is this extra assumption that seems to be, uh, you know, people like to put this extra assumption, uh, which is in the case of the alt Caffarelli Friedman functional, there was this penalty Q plus when you're positive, Q minus when you're negative. And they like to say that, for instance, Q plus is strictly larger than Q minus. Okay. Uh, it helps in the proof. Uh, I'm not completely convinced yet uh, that it's needed. Uh, and for us, it would be a little bit strange because we don't see why uh, one uh, region would be favored compared to another one. Uh, so I, I think it's an interesting thing that uh, uh, to look at. Okay. Uh, for if you want less, like for instance, if you want the description of blow up limits and so on and so forth, uh, you don't need that, right? Uh, and in particular, we have this, this description of a tangent. Uh, of a tangent, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, spaces to the boundary, to the free boundaries, uh, which we can get without this extra assumption. It, it looks like it's a hint that maybe C1 is also true in this case, but I, I'm, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm not positive about that. Uh, one third comment, and then I'll try to draw a picture of what, what I claim the minimizers look like. Uh, it turns out, so let's say, uh, we decided to take A positive, which means to pay for volume, because it's also much better 
in terms of a regularity result that we can get for a free boundary. Uh, e essentially, okay, I'll, I'll say that afterwards. Uh, uh, this way, uh, in fact, we sort of discovered that it's good to allow something which I'll call a black zone, where, which is not covered by the VIs. I didn't say that the VIs had to cover uh, the whole domain, okay? In terms of eigenfunctions, it means that you just declare that there will be a zone where the eigenfunctions will not like to be, okay? And apparently it works when I, okay? Uh, so uh, again, for us, it has two advantages. That it's one way to say that the, uh, that the free boundaries are nice, otherwise we wouldn't have that. And the second one is that it, it gives you some region where you bet that the eigenfunctions will not lead. And if the eigenfunctions actually don't live there, then we're happy, okay? And it looks like it's an idea, okay? Okay. And, okay, so I'll draw the picture in, uh, in one second. And I have one last comment. It just turns out that if you start with a number of phases, which is enormous, let the function only evolve, uh, it will only give you, uh, you know, bounded number of uh, phases. And I'll try to explain that on the... Uh, Okay. Okay. So let's see. Uh, the domain is, let's say, a square. Okay. And at the end, I claim the following thing. So, uh, you know, what I will draw is exact up to dimension three, modulo the fact that I'm going to draw curves as if they were C1, and I don't know they're C1 yet. They're just have a tangent uh, almost everywhere. Okay. So this is, let's say, you get the main domain here. Maybe, or maybe another one here, and let's say it's going to touch nicely. Uh, then maybe a third one. So I'm only allowed to draw smooth domains. So I cannot do anything else than that. From time to time, they go along with each other. And it's even worse, because when I'm getting at the boundary, uh, you would expect uh, this thing to go uh, straight to the boundary, because this is uh, what always happens. Nope. <laughs> Uh, so it will have to turn, okay, and then maybe there is a third, I mean another, uh, let's say the corner, uh, I claim they, they don't like corners, essentially. Okay. And okay, you can continue the picture. So this is what I claim is true, and then we did some experiments, maybe I'll show you at the end, it's not clear. <laughs> uh, it, I mean, uh, the things uh, the computer computes are not exactly what I described here. But I have the impression that the math are winning, so I, I claim this is what I did, okay? So there is this black regions here, which are good because this is the way you can maintain uh, smoothness of a free boundary, okay? Uh, they like corners. So why do they like corners? Uh, in a corner, if you look at a harmonic function, it tends to have a singularity which is much less wild than in a half space. In half space, you expect uh, functions which beha uh, that behave like affine functions. In the corner, let's say let's say we're in dimension two to simplify things, uh, you expect things that look like z to the power two, or uh, real part of z to the power two in a beautiful corner like this. So the gradient of a function in corners will be smaller, and it would be the same thing here. If there were to be a domain here. Uh, its gradient would have to be small because the function is harmonic and satisfies some boundary value equal to zero. And if the gradient is small, then uh, there was this, the only term that allowed you to win something, which is the integral of u on the domain. So this one will be small too. And eventually what happens is that it's not worth producing a domain like this because you pay for volume and you pay proportional to volume. If u is uh, small, uh, it's not your interest to put a function u there, okay? okay. Uh, this is the same reason uh, for saying that the domains are not too small. If the domain is too small, then you look carefully at what happens from Poincaré, you get that the function u is small, and if u is small, you pay too much for volume and it's not worth it, okay? So this part is under control, again, uh, this, the, the rest of it is more or less under control. Uh, the amusing thing at the boundary is typically the sort of things that the computer refuse 
<laughs> I don't know why uh, we made experiments and the computer refused and you know, things go directly to a boundary uh, as if. And at the beginning, we expected uh, you know, places where many phases would arrive, like for instance, three of them, because I like when it's three of them. And what happens here again is that if this were to exist in this region, the function u would have to be small because there is not enough space to produce a large function u. And in fact, I mean, in fact, one of the things in the monotonicity formula that I didn't uh, tell you about is it's precisely this, right? The monotonicity formula that I'm not writing down. You have a domain, let's say, on a sphere, and you're trying to make, uh, let's say, it's cut in two, and you're trying to look at what is the largest possible energy of a function in these two domains. And there is a competition between the two domains because uh, the largest the domain is, the easiest it is to produce functions with uh, large values, sorry, and a given energy. And it's the reason why the product is interesting, right? If one domain wins, uh, it can create a nice, beautiful function, but then on the other domain, uh, things get tougher. And the equilibrium is just when the domain is cut in two half spheres. And yeah, and that's the, yeah, that's the special case. And then the optimal functions are affine functions on both sides. Okay. So that's that's on general control. Okay. So uh, I'm testing my, so now I try to explain a little bit about pieces of a proof. And the piece of a proof that I will try to insist on is uh, this story about is the initial part where uh, the number of phases plays some role. Okay? So I'm back to this picture here. And let me start with something simple. Let's just try to see whether uh, I just minimize the energy of a function. Let's say in this case, in the picture, I took uh, three phases because uh, it doesn't make any difference uh, anyway. Uh, so I'm given Dirichlet values here, a function u. Let's say here I decided that u3 was positive, and of course, they live in different places. Maybe it's zero somewhere, but then it only helps. And uh, you can try just to minimize, uh, to minimize the values of this thing here, given the boundary, okay? So let me restate it in a slightly different way since I talked about spiders. So in this case, spiders would be, in this case, the spider would just be a union of three half lines, okay? And you could imagine, so the number of legs of a spider is n, in this case, three. Uh, you're looking at the function from, let's say, this disk to the spider. So this is, uh, with my notation, this is spider s3. Uh, and I mean, it's exactly the same thing. Instead of giving you three functions, I give you one function with values in the spider. And if, you know, if u1 is, let's say this is leg number one, if u1 is non-zero, you're here. If u2 is non-zero, you're there, and the same thing. Okay. And this way, I can try to find, uh, when I'm trying to minimize the energy, I'm just trying to find a harmonic function with values in the spider. Okay. What happens? So I think I got but anyway, this one, uh, I mean, I, uh, okay, I just put it on and, uh, okay. Okay. Uh, at the beginning, what happened is that we first thought that we would be able to use harmonic functions on spiders as the extension, so as to prove a theorem. Uh, but we didn't find the uh, theorems that we liked on harmonic functions on spiders. What we, what is known is much more general spaces than spiders. And then there are beautiful results uh, that say that the functions are Holder continuous. Okay. Uh, the proofs were complicated and it didn't seem to be, uh, we also wanted the thing to be sufficiently stable so that when we change the problem a little bit, things still are reasonable. And, uh, okay. and the, uh, so what we get here as a byproduct of what we're doing is the fact that harmonic functions with values on spiders are Lipschitz. Okay. Um, you know, this is where I'm trying my luck. Uh, did anyone of you n know that before? So I think I was told that a student of Shane did something like this in his thesis, but then I didn't have news and I didn't find. So, yeah. But I it's an interesting question, I think. Uh, anyway, right? Take harmonic functions with values in spiders. What do they look like? Okay. 
And again, I, I hoped at some point of time to be able to use how many functions we valued on spiders to prove something. And uh, it turned out uh, it was the other way around. Okay. So anyway, this, is, this was the story uh, about, uh, about spiders. Okay, so this is just if there is no other sign uh, with the regularity. Okay. And then I have come back a little bit. So I'll just give you one competitor. So all this game is always trying to find competitors, right? And I told you before, when there is only two faces, one of the main competitors that exists is harmonic extension, like the sort of thing we're trying to do on spiders. So let's think about spiders again. So or what is reasonable harmonic extension? So first, it is still, uh, maybe I should have said, right, it's still a three-boundary problem because essentially uh, you want to decide where the functions u1, u2, and u3 will live, I mean, in which leg of a spider. Then as soon as you decided uh, what is the three-boundary, of course, you take the harmonic extension with value of zero here, so that's uh, easy. But what you don't know is this three-boundary here. Okay, so it's still the same sort of three-boundary. Okay. So uh, most of the time in pictures like this, we don't know what to do, so we have to avoid this case. What happens is that there are a certain number of cases where we know what to do, and I'll, okay, I'll draw one. Uh, I guess you'll see what I mean. Uh, uh, let me even, okay. In fact, it's enough. Uh, for many of the uh, uh, statements to imagine that, okay, so let's say here I'm saying in one, in this picture and on the boundary, there is one function which is clearly dominated in uh, respect to the other one, either because in fact the domain uh, where two functions u2 or u3 is small, or because u2 and u3 are much smaller than u1, and usually they come together, because, uh, you know, since the function is equal to zero each time you change, uh, if this domain is very small, it is going to be very hard for u2 to be large. Okay? And I'm saying, what is a nice extension here? And of course, now that I drew the picture, you can have a guess of what we're doing. So this is our favorite competitor. We draw a second sphere close to the first one. On this sphere, we do radial extension. It's not going to cost us in, in anything because, uh, so here you just extend. U1 radially. If we extend everything radially, we're back to exactly the same problem on the inner sphere, so that's not what I want to do. And you cut U2, U3, which just means that you replace them by U, uh, U2 uh, tilde is equal to some cutoff function psi times uh, U2. Okay, so you make it disappear here. Zero. Zero. So you do it on a thin annulus. So if these functions u2 and u3 are small enough, you can cut them. It costs you something, but it's not so bad. And now we're left with a situation where you have just one function living. Uh, we could have been allowed a second one, but it doesn't matter. And we just extend harmonically. Looks stupid, but it's you know, it's the main missing through uh, in uh, in our business, right? Uh, okay, so e essentially what I'm saying with these essentially two competitors: harmonic extension when you can um, kill the function when it's when you think it's too small, uh, and then w what happens is that of course we we end up with lots of cases because uh, we have to come back to these sort of situations. The other situation is when you have two beautiful functions living nicely, and maybe a third one you cut it off, and uh, things like this. So we distinguish cases, but we, yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I'm claiming the main new ingredient is playing with this guy uh, a little bit more. Okay, and then we continue. Let me see what I, yeah. Maybe I can show one of the pictures. Okay, I'm I'm sorry. This is not. I, I understand that it is not much in terms of proof. Uh, some of the other proofs are beautiful, uh, and I can say it uh, more easily because uh, they often come from the initial papers of Alka, Farley, and Friedman, slightly modified. Let, let me try to 
show you. Uh, no, nothing. No. Just so I'm not sure I will be able to give you. Uh, so this was one of the square domains. It's, uh, in fact, it's exactly the same one as the Martel pictures that I showed you at the beginning, which was uh, then it was a better test. So as you see, so this is uh, the thing that Stephen computed with a certain number of domains. He didn't say in advance how many domains, but he started a few domains at point, and then he let them evolve with a functional and got this. Uh, again, I mean, there is... Uh, you know, there is 10 features. If I had my Mac, I could show you them at the same time, but now I'm not sure I can do that. Uh, they, they look alike, right? Essentially, in this, in this case, I, I can tell you, he essentially stopped at the first one, which looks weird, which means I think there is one that was leading. Let me see if I have one more. Okay. Uh, it was leading just at the boundary here, and this is where he stopped uh, looking. Okay. It, I, I don't think it is, the little dots here, I don't think you pay attention, it's where he started domain. And, uh, okay. And the amusing thing to me is that if you look at the way they arrive to the boundary, it's really doing the opposite of what I claim <laughs> it is. I, uh, I think it's hard to, I mean, apparently it's very easy to compute a solution to a e differential equation. But then there are many domains and uh, trying to evolve, I mean, to minimize the functional along things like flows or gradients uh, takes a lot of time. And that's the reason why these features, I think, are not too precise. Or we have a wrong theorem and, uh, you know, you can consult and uh, try to prove the mistake. Okay. So this is not too conclusive. Um, at least here there is a lot of black zones. And uh, the eigenfunctions are nice to us. They didn't put themselves in the middle of a black zone. Okay, so at least the, I mean, at least we could say we invented the black zone. It's nothing new. Yeah. Okay, thanks a lot. I think it's time. Yeah. So, uh, well, at the same time, I, we, so with this thing, no. Uh, with, with the computer, no. It just, I mean, it, I mean, in some sense, uh, I understand your suggestion, but, you know, this functional should do what it's told to do, right? And we have to understand why it's not doing it, right? And then not simplify the thing. Uh, what you were saying here? Uh, hmm? Oh, it's going to the boundary vertical. Okay. So now, if we're talking about the free boundary, okay, if we're talking about the regularity for the free boundaries, yes, I think, for instance, this is something we claim to be able to do with Satya Nathol, the different uh, sort of, uh, in this case, for the dimensions up to three, the boundary is really C1, I think. I mean, I think means it has to be. But So the impression I have is that uh, it's the use it, uh, asking only for one phase is not going to help tremendously. At this time, we are not so unhappy. I mean, we have bounds on uh, you know what's the size of the region and why it doesn't go to corners. Uh, I mean, we complained about the computer, but that's a different story. Uh, and of course, I mean, there are bounds, I mean, there are mathematicians' bounds, right? It's, uh, you know, maybe it's 10 to the 10, uh, whereas obviously it's going to be smaller. Uh, my co-author, uh, Marcel, so the physicist, uh, says uh, the following thing. I, I think he's wrong, but anyway. He says, you go to a mathematician, you ask them for a uniform bound. They say, okay, I can get a uniform bound, maybe 10 to the 10. You decide 10 to the 10 is equal to 1, and it works. <laughs> 
well, anyway, I, I don't know if I'm answering uh, this thing, but uh, to some extent, only one phase does not seem to help enormously in any of those uh, things. In, uh, you know, it's true that two phases is tougher because of this business between two plus and two minus. Otherwise, things, uh, you yeah. know, at the end, we know. Yeah. Yeah, they, I mean, uh, again, I, I think, you know, I didn't say everything. I, I think we sort of control that reasonably well. Modulo constant. Yeah. But the thing is, that, that my understanding is that the money is that the, the platinum structure is mostly useful. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, in this case, yeah, no, it had been a, uh, this is a good mean to know in our case and yeah. Okay, thank you. Oh, you're here. So I wanted to eject cleanly, but uh, ah, and I can video this. <laughs>